So the last meta-analysis is a pretty often cited one. It was published in 2007, and they looked at about 300 studies and eventually included about 18. And this was in critically ill patients, and it was for the diagnosis of sepsis. But it, if you read the paper, you'll see that it, neither is really very specifically defined. The result of this meta-analysis, as far as the authors were concerned, was that procalcitonin was not terribly helpful for the diagnosis of sepsis. It generated a number of letters, which are very interesting to read, and I've included in the next slide from the response of the authors of the meta-analysis to the letters that were published, they actually graphed the odds ratio of the uh, four meta-analyses that I've showed you their own and the three that I were previously done. And they were sort of critical of this odds ratio of 10, which I think is actually pretty good, and, and many people I've spoken to agree that it's pretty good. But I think the key thing about all these meta-analyses and conclusions drawn from them is that they eliminate a large number of studies because the studies are heterogeneous. Even in this summary, you can see that the patient populations here are all very different, depending on how you consider that this one was defined. So with that background, I'm going to pose four major questions about the use of PCT to diagnose sepsis and what I've learned from reviewing the literature in this field. The first one is, I think, a key one. Which patients need an initial PCT level? Who should have PCT drawn and tested? And the best answer I can give is it should be people who are at risk of developing severe sepsis. So it should be people who are critically ill and either known to be infected or suspected of being infected, and what you're worried about is that they're going to progress to severe sepsis. I offer this receiver operator curve from an from a article just as an example of how I think that if you tease out this application of PCT, you'll find that it's, it's almost unanimously much, much better than any of the other markers we currently have, or at least the markers that are currently commercially available, to sort of predict the risk of developing severe sepsis in a person who is at risk of developing severe sepsis already, in other words, with a, with a high pretest probability. And it just so happens that this is the current FDA claim. So it's pretty clear that a lot of thought went into the FDA claim for the commercially available PCT assays. It's true of the Biomirror U1. It's also true of the others. There are several now available commercially. And I believe that they all have the same, the same claim that it's intended for use in conjunction with other laboratory findings, clinical assessments, to aid in the risk assessment of critically ill patients on their first day of the ICU admission for progression to severe sepsis and septic shock. It's pretty clear. And I think that when we implement PCT in the laboratory, we really should try to convince clinicians to stick to this application, which is the one where I think it has the most use, at least at the current time. The second question is, okay, so we've decided that we need to order PCT in people who are at risk of developing severe sepsis. What if we do it and it's not elevated, should we do it again? I think the answer to that question is yes, but the answer to the question, well, when should we repeat the PCT, is really not clear. I've sort of taken two graphs from articles that were published by the same investigators who have done a lot of work in PCT. This one is relatively early on. It's from 1999. And you can see that in this population, the initial procalcitonin was really not that helpful in terms of predicting survival in this group of patients who were in the ICU. Many of these patients probably had sepsis or developed sepsis. The investigators didn't characterize that. But you can see that initially, in this particular study, you would say, well, the initial PCT isn't as helpful as monitoring PCT later on during the patient's hospital stay, at least in terms of predicting survival. And then the same investigators, a couple of years later, published another study, and this was a much better study, and it was a, a prospective study where they actually looked at the development of sepsis in patients who had trauma. So I was interested in this study because this answers the question of whether trauma alone can elevate your PCT, and the answer is yes, these patients some were probably infected on admission, but most of these patients were not, and these were all patients who were the victims of a very severe high-velocity motor vehicle accident. So this just shows you that an elevated PCT on admission is, is not necessarily indicative of infection, although it probably is predictive. Again, 
the patients who had a motor vehicle accident but didn't develop sepsis during their ICU stay had lower PCTs than the patients who were admitted and did develop sepsis. So it's unclear, but those are two snapshots of possible uh, uses. And then the study that's the most quoted for determining usefulness of sequential or repeat PCT tests is this study from 2006. They didn't really define what increasing means, but they definitely showed that an in increasing PCT over the early first few days of a patient's ICU stay was very predictive of, of their outcome. This study, as I said, is, is uh, often quoted for the use of time, time PCT. In fact, the editorial that accompanied this study was titled, Let's Go Dynamic with PCT. Kind of like that. I think that we'll have an answer to this question very soon because these investigators have just completed a large trial where procalcitonin results will be used to sort of immediately affect some sort of diagnostic or therapeutic response. If you want more details about this study, which I think wound up and is completed as of March of this year, you can go to www.clinicaltrials.gov. It's the PASS study, P-A-S-S. -S. It's number 10 on the list on that website. And I'm anxiously awaiting the results of that study because it will sort of give us a much better indication of how useful sequential PCT results are. But I would have to say at the current time, we're not really sure how frequently they should be ordered. I would say just a sort of a, a, a rule of thumb that's worth following is at least once a day during the first week of intensive care unit stay. Then the third question is what cutoff should be used? This is a really important question. It basically defines whether the PCT is, quote, elevated or not. And maybe we should have different cutoffs for the initial PCT and different cutoffs for the repeat determinations. Again, there's no really good answer. And actually, the answer that is in the package insert of any of the commercially available PCT assays that you look at implementing in your laboratory will show the same cutoffs that have been used even back when the assay was in chemi luminescent batch analyzer. And this is less than 0 0.5, is low risk of severe sepsis and greater than 2, is high risk of severe sepsis and in between is intermediate. That's probably not going to turn out to be this easy, especially given the fact that we've already shown that patients who don't have necessarily a high risk of severe sepsis, who just have a lot of trauma, can have elevated PCTs in this range. And the best thing I could find in the literature was this study that was done in 2006, where it was actually clear that to get relatively good performance of the PCT assay to predict the risk of developing sepsis, you had to have a different cutoff if the patient arrived in the ICU via the medical service versus the surgical service. The medical service is here in red and the surgical service is here in black. And so obviously patients who were admitted from the surgical service had more trauma, they had just been operated on, and they tended to have higher PCT results on admission to the ICU without having necessarily increased risk of developing severe sepsis. And so they felt that they would need to use a higher cutoff whether or not this will be the cutoff remains to be seen. It's clear that a lot of additional work needs to be done in this area. And then as far as stress causing an elevated PCT, what could be more stressful than being born? And it's well known that newborns, even without infection or without risk of developing infection or sepsis, have very elevated PCT levels during the first 48 hours of life. And this is something that obviously needs to be taken into account if you're going to be offering procalcitonin as a marker in the neonatal intensive care unit. So finally, this is a question more for the future, what other markers should be used in concert with PCT? I think that we already have some markers that we are already using, especially CRP, C-reactive protein. I don't necessarily think that procalcitonin need replace CRP if your physicians are already using CRP to help monitor patients in the intensive care unit. It may be a helpful additive, but I think the future probably holds some promise for more novel markers. The focus, I think, will be on the poly, morphonuclear leukocyte. As I've said before, we know in the laboratory when someone has severe sepsis because we see in their polys these toxic granulations or doly bodies, which are the changes in the lysosomes and actually leakage of the lysosome. The poly is so activated that the lysosome is leaking and actually starting to dissolve the, the proteolytic enzymes and the acid are starting to dissolve the cytoplasm of the poly. 
Well, there's a marker called CD64, an activation marker, which can be detected by flow cytometry, which is a much earlier marker of polyactivation. And this has a lot of promise, especially since, I mean, whether or not they order procalcitonin in the intensive care unit, they're certainly going to be ordering white cell count and differential. And if you can simultaneously detect CD64, that can be a positive piece of helpful information. There's other markers that are more in the chemistry realm, like soluble TREM, which is a marker of uh, activation that is lost from the cell surface and can be measured in the plasma. And another uh, marker, heparin binding protein, has been looked at. And again, I want to end with this final slide before we go to questions. The probable, eventual way that we really nail down the ability to predict risk of severe sepsis is going to be using a multi-marker approach as shown in this demonstration project where using either three or six of the markers, regardless of what they are, is better than using any one marker alone. With that, I think I'll turn the webinar back to Steve and see if there are any questions from the audience.